So last time we proved the lower bound on the extremal number of given graph using probabilistic method. More precisely, we use the alteration method, and we get this lower bound. But this is in general not tight. <coughs> Another way of, I mean, getting lower bounds for. I mean, this extremal number is getting helps from algebra. So for example, a simple case, we know that the extremal number of k to 2 is at least half times, I mean, half minus 3 to 1 times n to the 3 over 2. And on lecture 22, we proved that this is a most half plus 0, 1 times n to the 3 over 2. So this determines that uh, this extremal number is roughly half times n to the 3 over 2 plus some lower order term. So this determines the asymptotics of this function in a precise manner. And we actually learned about this in undergraduate graph theory. But we will repeat the proof to see it again. So for first, I mean, to get the help from algebra, we want to work with the prime number instead of just any, I mean, number. We want the number of vertices to be prime number. So for that, we use the following trick. We know that there exists a prime number p between 1 minus 0 of 1 times square root of n minus 1 and square root of n minus 1. Wait, uh, give me a moment, sorry. Square root of n plus 1. I think this 1 doesn't really matter that much, but let's just say, yeah, square root of n plus 1. And we consider the, I mean, this is possible because in number theory, we know the, we know that between, I mean, any real number x and x minus x to the 0, I mean, some say constant times x to the 0 0.6 and x. There is just some constant shape such that for any positive real number x, we can always find the prime number, which is at least this big and at most this big for any real number which is bigger than I mean any let's say any natural number bigger than 2 or 3 3 then this is always possible I mean simpler form of this result is that the Bertrand's Bertrand's postulate says that between x and 2x or any x at least, I mean, any natural number at least 2. Between these two numbers, you can always find the prime number. That's one of the things that's well known. And then it's even improved now that uh, between x and 0 of 1, I mean, 1 minus 0 of 1 x, you can find the prime number. So if you let this x and here we can just, I mean, put some constant times, x minus constant times x to 0 0.6, which is 0 over 1 times x. So we can find the prime between these two numbers if n is large, assume n is large. And we consider graph G, which is called polarity graph with the following. So 
So we consider the field on P elements and we take the tuple of that and we remove the origin. And let's say number of, I mean the edges. Two vertex a comma b and x comma y forms an edge if ax plus by is one. So this defines a graph. We specify the vertices and we specify the edges. And now what we want to show is that it has at least this many edges and it doesn't contain any k22. And what does it mean by it doesn't contain k22? It means if you have a two vertex, then we consider the number of common neighbors. If it has two common neighbors, then we already get k22. So it has at most one common neighbor. That's equivalent of saying that there is no K22. So, for two distinct vertices, say U, which is A comma B, and V, which is A comma A prime comma B prime of G. Let's count how many common vertices, common neighbors are there. If x comma u y is adjacent to both u and v, that means a x plus b y equal one, and a prime x plus b prime y equal one. Ah, yeah. By the way, if this definition may give you a loop. But let's just say we delete loops. So for example, 1 comma 1, I mean, and 1 comma 1 are in this definition adjacent. So it has a loop here, but we just forget the loop. <coughs> then u and v are distinct. I mean, okay, before saying that. So let's see, I mean, if we consider this one equation, what would the solution set look like? If this was say A and B are both one and zero, let's say A is one, B is say one, then it, zero comma one is one, and two comma negative one is also one, three comma negative two is also one. So, in that case, y is 1 minus x, and x can vary to p numbers, and y also changes accordingly. So this actually forms a line in the space. I mean, if you consider fp here, fp here, then this forms a discrete line. And that's also same on the other part, the other line. And if u and v are distinct, then the set of points in fp2, fp squared, satisfying each equation forms a line in F2 and two lines are different. So it's easy to actually check that. So the solution for common solution for both defines a single point and most one point okay
Let's write it this way. Hence, there are the most one solution for this system of equations. Hence, there are at most one common neighbor of U and V. And C does not contain any K to 2. So this shows that it doesn't contain K to 2. Then, does it have this many edges? To count the number of edges, we need to first check the degrees of the vertices. For fixed A and B, if you consider the number of solutions of X, Y in here, we can check that uh, it's always p. So there are p solutions. But one of them, I mean, each of them defines a uh, edge, but one of them could define a loop at that point, at that vertex. So every vertex has degree either p or p minus 1. So total number of edges is at most, no, at least at least p minus one times. I mean. How many number of vertices are there? Number of vertices there is p squared minus 1. And you have to divide it by half because this is a degree sum. And from here, what does the p? p is between these two numbers. So this we know that this is at least half times 0 of 1 times n to the 3 over 2. And if the number of vertices is what at most, the number of vertices is p squared minus one, but by our choice, that's between n and one minus three row of n. It may be smaller than n, so we add some isolated vertices to make it have and vertices. Then we are done. <coughs> so this shows a lower bound on the extreme number of k to 2. So next natural question is what about extreme number of k3, 3 then? In 1966, Brown showed that uh, this is at least half times minus 3 of 1 times n to the 5 over 3. So this construction is, I mean, before that we also know that we can also we also know that the, I mean, corresponding upper bound for this. We know that this is also half times 0, 1 to the n to the 5 over 3. We can actually prove this. Uh, 
uh, for this, I mean, we also use some algebraic, I mean, construction to obtain a construction with this many edges having no K33. Roughly, I mean, here, what, I mean, we are going to omit the proof, but the roughly what you can do is that here in K22, you define the, I mean, edges by this linear equation. So common neighbor of, neighborhood of one vertex defines roughly a line. And two vertices, if you consider common neighborhood, then it's an intersection of two lines, so which defines one point. So here, you can, what you can do is you consider a three-dimensional space instead of two. And then each vertex, I mean, has a neighborhood, which forms a roughly a sphere. So, I mean, the points which are distant one from this specific point. Then you have n is roughly p square, and then each vertex has a, I mean, its number of neighbor is roughly p square. So that explains you why we get this number here. So each degree is p square, and then n is p to the three. Then number of edges is some constant times n, to, I mean, p to the five, which is some constant times n to the five or three. So each vertex, I mean, it's a, it's a neighborhood forms a sphere. Then if you consider three vertices and this neighborhood and this neighborhood and this neighborhood, if you consider the intersection, two spheres, I mean, intersecting, they form, the intersection forms some circle. And you add one more, then intersection is at most roughly two. I mean, intuitively, it should have uh, two, two points. So it doesn't have K33. So on, of course, this is not rigorous. This is just some intuition, but uh, you, that's roughly how this proof goes. And more generally, Paula, Ronia, Sabo in 1996 proved that if T is quite bigger than S, at least S prime plus one, then we know this external number KST is actually, I mean, some constant times two minus one over S. The upper bound comes from kobari run, so we only have to prove the lower bound. This lower bound can be achieved by using another algebraic construction. So in the next video, we will prove this modulo sum using some known theorems in algebra.